Uh, my name is Grant Fritchie. Uh, I do work for Redgate Software, and I want to talk to you about SQL Backup Pro 7.0. SQL Backup Pro is our backup management software. It's pretty cool. It brings a whole bunch of new functionality into the system that you're not going to get with just SQL Server. First off, you get central management. You're going to be able to manage more than one server, all from a central location, where you can monitor the backups, schedule the backups, schedule restores, manage the system, know what went wrong, find out where the problems are, all from one location central to your system. Secondly, you're going to get compression. Now, I realize SQL Server uh, 2008 and better offers compression for the standard system, um, standard uh, enterprise and above, but we offer compression for all versions of SQL Server, including Express, uh, SQL Server 2000, so you can get a lot more um, stuff out of it. Plus, our compression is actually a little bit better. Uh, you pay for it with CPU, but you do get more compression um, with our system. Also, we offer encryption on your backups, uh, direct encryption on the backups themselves. And as Michael mentioned, um, security is one of the problems people run into with their backups. And our encryption enables you to get better security on your backups. We also um, offer a lot of automation on backups and restores. Now, we have several wizards that allow you to set up your backups, set up your restores. I'm going to be demoing some of those today. And we have other mechanisms through scripting that allow you to take direct control over how all of your backups run through SQL Backup Pro across all of your servers. And finally, I've already mentioned it, but it's worth bringing up again, we support all the versions. We go from SQL Server 2000 right up to 2012. Uh, 2012 is only a couple of weeks old at this point, but we already support it. Um, it works. The demo today will be against SQL Server 2012, um, running at local in my machine and inside of a virtual machine. And so that's pretty much it. Now, that's all of the stuff that makes up SQL Backup Pro, but you don't really care about any of that. You really want to see the demo. So let's go and play. Now, this is the SQL Backup Pro window. I'm connected up to two different servers currently. Over here you can see I'm connected up to my uh, local VM and I'm connected up to my own local laptop machine. I've got uh, SQL Server running on both. I've already got the SQL Backup Pro installed on both. And it, so it gives me a whole bunch of different functionality. Now the first piece of functionality I want to point out to you is just right here on the screen. And what we've got is a schedule and a record of backups that I've run. So you can see I've got activity history down here on the bottom showing for the server the backups that have run, when they were run, whether or not they were successful. And if I scroll through it, I can go backwards in time and see if I've got failures or not, and it's all visible. You can sort on any of these columns, so you can try to find um, if there's anything missing. You can sort on the type of backups, again, on the action, all these different bits of information allow you to understand what's going on inside your system. You've also got a graphical interface up here that shows you a timeline. So over time, what's been occurring inside your system. And again, these are multiple systems on multiple servers, all managed from a central interface. So you can track all the work that's going on. Now, if backups are in progress, you can actually see them as they're occurring. So if you've got some long running backups, or even if you've got backups that are blocked by some other process, you would actually be able to come in here and see them. If you've got um, jobs in, on the server themselves, we can actually see the jobs. Now, you can see some of my jobs failed. These are my, again, this is my, my test laptop server. I mess up a lot of stuff on here on purpose um, just so I have things to demonstrate. And, and you know, obviously, I've got jobs named test and other things like that, um, just all as part of a management process that I run locally to, to make sure I'm getting things right. But anyway, you get the idea. Now, coming back up to the backups, this is the important stuff. Now, you can just run through this interface a backup, or you can run through this interface a restore. But the real power comes into some of the, the help that we provide to you in the ability to schedule your backups or schedule your restores. Now, scheduling backup jobs is pretty cool. Let's open this up. Obviously, you get to pick and choose which server you want to go to. You can use an existing template if you've created any, but I'm not going to worry about that for the moment. 
you get to pick the type of backup, whether or not it's full differential, transaction log, file group, whatever you need. Um, you can also do copy-only backups directly from here if, if you're worried about breaking the uh, backup chain with differential. You can pick all of your user databases or you can pick and choose which databases you want. You can also do the same thing with your system databases. Clicking up here, you can pick and choose which system database you want to back up. Now, it's, it's your call how you lay this out. Your system, your needs are going to drive how you do your backups. Obviously, some systems are going to need, you know, some of the databases are going to need a daily backup. Others may only need a weekly. And you'll be able to set up different schedules for the databases all through here. Let's keep going. If we want to create a schedule, we can set it up. It's pretty standard schedule stuff. I'm not going to spend too much time here because it'll bore you. Let's move on. This is where things get fun. How we're going to configure these backups are where things get interesting. Now, I've got a very simple setup where I'm going out to an external drive um, I have attached to my laptop and allows me to do my backups out to there. But you could put them onto a network share or any other kind of um, drive you need. Don't back them up to your system disk. That's a bad practice. Anyway, you can decide whether or not you want to override, whether you delete existing files, and if you do delete them, how often they get deleted. And you can manage your entire backup process directly through here. Uh, let me move back up to the top a little bit. You can, if you need to, if you're dealing with large systems, split your backups into multiple files. That's a huge advantage for really big databases um, because you can write to multiple disks with multiple spindles um, spreading the work. But generally, your smaller systems, say less than three, 400 gigs, you're not going to need to do that. A single backup file will cover you. Now, one of the other things that was Michael mentioned was redundancy. Built into our tool is the ability to, as part of your backup process, immediately copy it across the network. Now, you get the same kind of management of the file itself, whether or not you overwrite and whether or not you keep deleted files and where it goes, all built in, but it's automated. If you decide to set this up, you can automate it. And that's just one of the keys for me is automation because automation means repeatability. If you get it automated correctly, you can run it over and over again, which is a huge plus for, for doing backups. Let's move on. So we have compression. Our compression has multiple levels. Now we have minimum compression with highest speed, maximum compression with lowest speed. So we're right out front. If you need to save disk space, we can help you, but it's going to run slower. There's no, no other ways to say it. You can set this up any way you want, set it however you like, or you could run a compression analyzer. Now the compression analyzer is going to pick a database, and let's just say, um, AdventureWorks 2008 R2, we'll start the test. It's going to run, and it takes a little while to run. I may not let it run the entire time. Okay, there it goes. It went pretty quick. So it looked at 11% of the data. Oh, it's, it's looking at it now. You can see how it's going. So when it's deciding which of these compression algorithms is going to give you the best mechanism to get your compression down. And it's going to show you how much it's going to compress. I mean, in theory, level four is going to at least currently compress around 84%, 85%. That's excellent. So you're going to take a database that was 246 megs and get it down to 28. Nice savings. And obviously, it finished up. And now you can see how it works. And you can run this for each of your systems if you want to. But it'll give you an idea of, of what you're trading off. If you want to run level one compression, you can get it down to 50, 50 megs. Great. But if you need to save space and you're willing to pay the cost, you can actually cut that down by another 22 megs, almost 50%, um, to bring it down to here, which is pretty cool. Anyway, let's decide what we want to do. And now you can also encrypt your backup, provide a password, confirm that password, and please don't lose that password because once it's gone, it's gone. You can encrypt your backup. Now, that adds to your backup security. I mentioned that already, and Michael mentioned it during his presentation. You also get the opportunity to use multiple threads, take advantage of multiple CPUs, and all that fun stuff. Let's hit next. This is where things get great, because I love this part of it. Um, this is something new with 7.0, something I'm very excited about, because I was pushing for it, and now it's here, and I'm just pleased as I could be. 
That is the ability to run checksum. Now, it only works on 2005 and better. Guys, if you're still running 2000, I'm sorry, you can't do it. But checksums basically validate the writes as they occur to the disk. So your backup writes are getting validated. Now, that doesn't say that your database is perfect, and that doesn't say that your backup is perfect, but the writes are going to get validated so you know that you're not, you know, you know you haven't messed up your backup as you go, which is huge win. Then you can run verify only, which, again, Michael talked about testing. This allows you to test your restore. Not completely, because verify only just does a header check and a checksum check, if checksums were used. For full testing, you need to do more. And that's where this little bit comes in down here, backup verification reminders. We're going to create a reminder, and I've already got them created. I'm not going to create it from here. We're going to create a reminder that tells me I need to get a restore verification set up, that I need to schedule a restore, because the one sure, 100% proof positive way to validate your backups is to run a restore. If you're just running checksum, or if you're just running verify, or if you're running both, you're only checking some of the database backup. If you want a complete check, you need to run a restore. So we're going to set up a reminder here that will let you know. Finally, you get to review all your choices. If you mess something up, you go back and fix it. Or, best of all, this is the part I like, you can script it all out. Now, I love using the script because it allows me to take direct control. I can make manipulations if I want funky naming standards or anything like that that aren't provided through the tool, although the tool is very powerful in what it does. I've got more direct control that I can do through T-SQL. Um, I like running my T-SQL. I like messing with my T-SQL. So coming in here and, and getting this direct control over the script is a big deal for me. So when you hit Finish, what it's going to do is create um, a job. It's going to be a, a, in your SQL agent process. And you'll be able to see it here, and they're marked. The Redgate backup jobs are marked, and you can reopen them if you need to. And you can see the ones that, are, that I've set up in the past and how they were set up and what the schedules are and all that fun stuff, exactly how I've set it up. Now, I mentioned this, but let's bring it up, the reminders. I've got reminders for databases where I have not yet created a restore schedule for backup testing, for backup verification. So let's use our reminder and schedule a restore now. So what we get is our destination server. Now, this again, this is a test bed, so I'm going to my local machine. Um, in the real world, you're going to want to be able to do a restore to someplace other than your production system, OK? You don't want to add additional load to production, so you're going to do this restore to some other system. But you get to search for what you're doing, either you know, search for the thing, search for specific files, search for a specific database, um, decide what you're going to use. You can do the latest full backup, or you can do a backup set, in which case it will get the full differential and logs up to a point in time and then generate a full restore for you. Again, this is a completely automated process. We can make your restores extremely simple and automate them so you do get full backup testing. Let's just step on through, because we've already got a folder set. We'll be able to find what we need. We can do one of two things. We can override an existing database. A nice choice. If you've already got a database there, you can override it. And that's great. But something to think about, <laughs> the reason I've got mine set up and the reason it defaults to create new database is so that you don't accidentally overwrite your production system. Because believe it or not, businesses get really upset when you take away their production data. I don't know why, but it just happens. So we're going to create a new database, and we're going to call it you know, our AdventureWorks 2008 R2 verification. And it's going to overwrite that same database name on any subsequent restores. And then I've got an option. I find it slightly dangerous especially if you're actually running this on a production system. But if you're not running on a production, it's only slightly dangerous. You can kill existing connections because, as you know, if there are existing connections on a database, restore will fail. So we can kill those off, and then it will run. 
but let's leave it alone because I'm nervous about things like that, so we'll just hit next. It automatically finds the logical names. It automatically maps them to the physical names so that it's going to the right place. You can adjust this so that it goes to default locations, or you can go to specified locations and build them out however you need to build them out in order to make sure that your automated restore runs correctly. Hit next, and this is where it gets fun. Again, we're back to the testing that Michael talked about. We can run all these great checks. We can run database consistency checks. We can add extended logical checks, do physical only, um, apply it with table locks, however you need to run it. But what this does is it allows you to take your database consistency checks offline because you don't have to run a DBCC check and then run a backup. What you can do is simply run a backup and then run your restore operation, which Redgate SQL, uh, SQL Backup Pro will automate for you. Run the restore, which does two things. It allows you to validate your backup, which is great, and two, you can automate running the DBCC checks against that restored database. The way backups work, it's a page-by-page, bit-by-bit copy. Therefore, this restored database is the same as your production database. If there's corruption, we'll find it. It's, it's just part of the restore process. It's nothing magical that we're doing. It's just a, a thing that you can take advantage of. Then you can drop the database following the restore, so you're not wasting space. You can set this up and schedule it so you're running a series of them, restore one at a time, validate them, and then remove them. And you can make sure you remove it on success or always. Personally, I would only, um, I'd probably remove them all always and just make sure that it's reporting to me when there are errors. Let's go to the next step. If you need to, you can leave this in standby. If you need to, you can do checks for ORFID users. And most importantly, I don't have it configured on my system since I do all my testing locally, but most importantly, you can set up email notifications. So when this succeeds, or when it fails, or both, you can get an email. This is huge. This is where, this is where you get your advantages of automated testing and automated verification. Let's move forward. Obviously, we set up a schedule again. I'm not going to waste your time with, with defining what schedules are. And then finally, you see all the choices we made are summaried. And once more, I get my choices on scripting. And I do love scripting. So I can get it all out of a script right here. And so when I hit finish, which I'm not going to do right now, that would then automatically go into a um, setting up a restore process. And I would be able to see all my restores occurring on a scheduled basis on, on whichever server I set them up for. Let's see, is there anything else to cover? Uh, we also have log shipping. Um, there are whole sets of reporting. We have multiple um, utilities. Uh, you can definitely, if we've got stuff that's compressed or encrypted, you can unencrypt it and uncompress it back out to standard backups so you can restore those in some other fashion. And it's pretty much all automated. And uh, that's all I've really got for you today.